In Sydney, Australia, an industrial army is called into action. No one has ever embarked on the scale of what we're doing here. Deep out of sight, beneath the harbour city, a battle unfolds. There's constant problem solving. Every day there's new problems, there's new issues. Battalions of engineers pit giant machines against rock and mud. To drive a new metro system through the beating heart of the city. We have to get there, there's no other way. The stakes are high and the clock is ticking. You've got to take every bit of luck you can get, don't you, in this game? This is by far and away the biggest public transport project in Australia's history. If I'm honest, I probably didn't quite know what I was getting myself into. All across Sydney, the city's new mega metro is at a critical stage. 40,000 workers battle to create a $50 billion game changer to tackle the city's traffic nightmare. When it's complete, this new driverless railway will have dozens of new stations, more than 150 kilometres of track, and create a giant loop around Sydney. But they're working hard against the clock. Construction of the four kilometre long elevated viaduct, or Skytrain as it's known, is finally up to full pace. After stopping in the mud under Sydney Harbour, the crew on tunnel boring machine Kathleen are now back to full bore. And in the Hills district of Sydney, crews are feeling the pressure as the clock counts down to the opening of the first stage of the line, just a few short months away. Australia's first driverless metro line will open here in an area northwest of Sydney known as the Hills district. And at the end of the line, a new state-of-the-art metro trains facility is being constructed. The new fleet of fully automated trains will be maintained here and stabled overnight after the day's service. This extensive stabling yard will be the metro train's home. It won't be long before the first delivery of rolling stock arrives, but the yard is not yet ready. Even before the steel walls and roof have been completed, a super strong concrete floor is being poured to bear the weight of enormous train jacks. Phil Milford and Luke Reeves are under pressure to complete this as soon as possible. At the moment we're uh, finishing off the structural steel, we're putting the roof on and as you can see we're putting concrete down. It's important that the concrete's placed right. It's going to be in place for a 99-year life cycle. During all of that time, the concrete floor will need to be able to support massive amounts of weight. It's a series of jacks that lift the trains up. So the concrete in this area is very thick. It has to be to lift the weight of the trains up and the floor has to be really level as well. So it's really important we get everything in this area spot on. This important facility will not only stable the fleet of trains, but also house the most critical part of the new driverless train network, the operations control center, the brain and heart of the system. From here, a small team of controllers will manage Australia's very first fleet of fully automated trains remotely, with 98% on-time reliability. And crews are working flat out to get it built in time. At Central Station in the heart of Sydney, Construction director James Pierce and his team have been delayed by the discovery of an early 19th century cemetery on their site. They've been waiting patiently for months, 
And now the archaeologists have finally finished exhuming more than 60 graves. Great to finally get on with the job. We're finished with archaeology. Huge relief. James needs to get his dig back on track. And at last he can get moving to excavate the middle of Central Station. But the huge tunnel boring machines, or TBMs, coming from the south won't be breaking into this station box. It simply won't be deep enough in time. So instead, the TBMs will pass underneath. And later, the team will smash through the tunnels from above. So we go down from this level 30 metres deep into Sydney sandstone to meet where the TBMs come through. Because of the delay, James is way behind schedule and needs to make up time. But he also needs to be sure the work won't impact the passing passenger train services as they run right along the edge of the station box on both sides. The machine behind us is a piling rig. We install piles the entire way around the metro box into solid rock. The piles are constructed by drilling down dropping in a reinforcement cage and concreting the piles into place. The piles are absolutely critical to ensure that there's no movement on the rail. Without piles, we'd probably have two trains in the box. To make up for some of the lost time, James has three piling rigs working around the clock. All up, the station box needs more than 550 piles and 2,000 cubic metres of concrete to fill them, 330 truckloads. The piles alone are not enough to resist the massive ground pressure that builds as the hole gets deeper. It will also take hundreds of rock anchors and sprayed concrete. Very key part of what we're doing, and the piles give us a rigid solution to ensuring that none of the areas are going to move and we've got no displacement on the track. Back in the Hills District, the two massive launching gantries that will be used to build the four-kilometre Skytrain deck have been successfully assembled. And now, construction is starting to shift into top gear. When the alignment calls for the Skytrain's deck to be raised across a road, the work can only happen at night, when they can close the road below. It is the only time when the traffic can be diverted, controlled, stopped. After 842 segments lifted and 93 spans successfully installed, disaster strikes. In the middle of the night, something has gone wrong with span number 60. Marco and his team need to act quickly. We are trying to understand uh, what is going on. The team have discovered the problem. The middle of the span has buckled upwards, cracking and crushing the lower part. An investigation later discovers the cause. The tightening was the last uh, part of the sequence. Uh, yes, of course, this was the cause of the buckling. A concrete stitch join that was supposed to connect two segments failed. When the segments were tightened with steel cables, they buckled under the pressure. It's a costly error. The entire 40-metre span must be demolished. We are going to uh, dismantle everything and replace completely the span. The entire viaduct is double-checked for safety before progress can continue. It gets the all-clear, but they're losing time. Suddenly, the deadline for completion of the viaduct looks uncomfortably close. Not far away, the four tunnel boring machines in the Hills District are going full bore, carving out twin 15-kilometre tunnels from Bella Vista to Epping. After four long months of digging, TBM Isabel has reached her first major milestone. Well, that's it, guys. We've reached the lowest point. Here we are, 68 metres underground. Well done. Great stuff. Yeah. 
The TBMs don't stop for almost anything. They normally operate deep out of sight, hidden by the Earth. But today is a rare chance to see these monster machines in action. TBM Isabel and her sister, TBM Maria, traverse an air ventilation shaft that is still under construction. It gives a unique perspective on how they travel beneath the ground, moving like a giant mechanical worm, creating a chrysalis of concrete as it moves forward. Over the coming months, as the four tunnel boring machines continue on their way, the project team and some lucky members of the public who have been awaiting this new railway for decades are treated to some spectacular tunnel breakthroughs, one after another. until finally their missions are complete. Now their job is over, they're hauled back to the surface, piece by piece. The battle scars from their combat against Sydney sandstone are rusted on. At around $15 million a piece, they're now done and dusted. Under Sydney's spectacular harbour, the job for the crew of TBM Kathleen is far from done. Their mission is to dig an 884 metre long tunnel deep beneath Sydney Harbour, twice. Engineers Michaeli and Vincent have just replaced a giant metal wedge that came loose and threatened to cause damage to the cutter head. But just as they thought their problems were behind them, something might have gone wrong again, 50 metres below the surface of Sydney Harbour. A little bit of Ben and I go through and then... Project director Tim Parker gets an unexpected call early one Sunday morning. I get woken to something's going on, something unusual's happening in the harbour. There's bubbles. What is it? Is it a whale? Don't know. Security cameras quickly spot the bubbling and witnesses on the harbour capture it on a phone. The bubbles and our TVM are in a very similar position. Bubbles are not good. It means that something is going wrong. So there's a flurry of phone calls. What do you mean by um, Sunday morning? Got a phone call announcing bubbles in the harbour. Got in touch with the guys, trying to, to understand uh, the extent of the problem. There is a real fear for the TVM, and the crew scramble to make sure everyone is safe and to find the problem. If you think about bubbles, you think water is getting in as well. We knew a leak would have been possible, so we just came here straight away. After a tense few hours, the cause is finally discovered. It turned out that there was some compressed air coming out, and that was coming up through the surface. So with an adjustment of the compressed air, the bubbles disappeared. On other jobs, the bubbles may not have been as obvious as they worked their way through cracks in sand or layers of rock. But in the middle of Sydney Harbour, it's there for all to see. There is relief that the problem wasn't much more serious. Yeah, it was quite dramatic from outside, and people on the surface were a bit concerned, but it was all under control. It was actually a relatively simple fix, but at the time we didn't know. So an anxious couple of hours, but a happy ending. A few weeks after the Skytrain span buckled, Construction is safely underway again. The construction process has been changed, however, and an investigation concludes that all the spans are sound. Here at Rouse Hill, 50,000 vehicles use the six-lane highway Windsor Road every day. The rail viaduct will need to cross this large and busy road intersection to reach the Metro Trains facility on the other side. It's a formidable engineering challenge that falls to South African bridge designer, John Anderson. Because one of the real constraints for the project is to make sure that the 
The thousands of cars that go up and down Windsor Road are not impacted in any way. The, the concept that we've come up with is a combination of, of a number of engineering challenges. John's solution for the crossing is a distinctive cable stay bridge, which will be an Australian first design. In addition to building a concrete rail deck over a busy road, John has another engineering difficulty to overcome. In order to follow the designated rail alignment, the bridge must be curved. People often would warn you, don't do a curved cable state bridge, and people will often warn you, don't do a cable state rail bridge. So we had both. So it was perhaps a little bit brave, but uh, we went for it because essentially it seemed to be the right solution for the site. Even though John and his team are under pressure to get the bridge built as swiftly as possible, they have an ace up their sleeve, which allows construction to get underway quickly. One of the biggest aspects of us choosing a cable state bridge is that we could use the overhead gantry to build the bridge. These two gantries can erect spans in a curve because of their dimension. They are very long. Normally, cable state bridges are erected starting from the towers. So it is a revolutionary way of building this piece of structure. But building the curve is only part of the problem. The completed bridge with its towers and cable stays will be racked by contradictory forces. What happens is those cables want to pull the tower towards the center of the curve. And from a design perspective, that introduces a whole set of new challenges. We had challenges making the deck work. We had challenges making the tower work. John's calculations have to be spot on. If he gets it wrong, the trains that will later pass at speed along the curve could exert destructive pressures on the cables and towers. If it deflects too much, you get high stresses in the rail and potentially the rail can even crack. The most visually striking feature of the new bridge is its two steel towers built 17 kilometers away in a factory in Western Sydney. John personally oversees the progress of their assembly as any misalignment or inaccuracy could delay the completion of the bridge. The next hurdle will be to get these 29 meter high towers weighing more than 200 tons each to the Windsor Road site. There will be a little bit of nerves to make sure that everything uh, goes well, no doubt about it. Under a police escort in the dead of night, the towers make their way slowly to their final destination, where they will be lifted into position on the viaduct. A 55-metre-long truck with 18 axles is required to bring the towers to sight, lying on their side. Instead of using one huge tower crane, it takes two to lift each tower into a standing position. If it's rotating on the ground, you could potentially damage the base of the tower. You could put all sorts of unwanted stresses into the tower. Once upright, the tower is carefully lowered onto a series of bolts and secured into place. As dawn breaks the next day, the landmark structure can now be seen taking shape. It's a very exciting part of the construction step. You put all this effort in, and then, you know, it's large scale, it's dramatic. The two steel towers are then half filled with concrete. And once set, they should be solid and rigid enough to carry the weight of the 267 meter long bridge through the all important cable stays. Those cables are essentially for carrying the dead load of the bridge. Without it, the bridge wouldn't be able to carry the train load. Everything depends on the strength of these cables. So within one cable, you have 127 individual strands. Overall, we have something close to 173 kilometers of strand that are going to be installed into this bridge. Finally, with all the cables secured, they are tensioned and the scaffolding removed. A landmark bridge now stands on its own. 
it looks fairly simple. It was not simple to finally be at the stage after all the hours, all the effort, all the problems. It's fantastic. John is not the only one impressed with the outcome. This cable stay bridge, a fantastic landmark. It looks great and people will be able to always recognise where they are just by looking out the window and seeing the bridge. Further up the line at the Metro Trains facility, the enormous maintenance shed for the new trains is just about completed. Its large roof space is being utilised in a very practical way. With more than 3,200 solar panels being installed that will help power the facility as well as the new metro stations along the line. This rooftop array is as big as a football field. This sustainable solution will reduce the network's overall carbon footprint and can generate about 1,500,000 kilowatt hours of electricity per year, or enough to power about 270 average homes. Over in the stabling yard, the overhead wiring is being installed, and the operations control center is coming to life. But there's no metro without the trains. So it's a welcome sight when the first ones arrive. On a truck, protectively wrapped from the factory. With the truck backed up into position next to a ramp, the first carriage is winched slowly but surely down the incline. And onto the rails. It's then hauled along the line and into the vast maintenance shed where it comes to a stop and the chocks are applied. Only when safely inside its new home is the plastic sheeting cut away to reveal the sleek, Sydney-inspired design. The driving force behind this new railway, engineer and the city's transport chief, Rod Staples, is ecstatic. Nothing compares to what I'm standing in front of here today, which is the train. This is what it's all about. This is what customers will use every day. I'm so excited about this. This is absolutely the highlight of the project for me so far. French designer of the trains, Xavier Allard, also inspects his creation for the very first time. Safe to say, he's happy with the result. It's a very, very smooth and very uh, elegant shape without any aggressivity. So uh, it's, it's really, really strong. It's very pure, very simple, but very, very strong. Now the pressure is on to complete Sydney's first driverless metro line in time for the opening day. Eight new stations need to be delivered from the ground up. They have to be fully accessible for Australia's first fully accessible railway. Five existing suburban stations and 13 kilometres of existing twin tunnels have to be upgraded for driverless trains and the new metro system with new signalling and new safety technology. With the four kilometre sky train successfully finished and the trains on their way, an army of almost 20,000 workers descends on Sydney's northwest to start laying tracks, building car parks for 4,000 vehicles, and delivering the new stations high above the ground in cuttings and deep below the surface. And part of this construction operation is installing 42 escalators. Those at Norwest Station present a particular challenge.
This station alone needs eight escalators, including some of the longest on the project. This one is 60 meters long, twice as long as the gap it needs to fit through. It takes two cranes working in tandem to negotiate the narrow space. And being an escalator, it comes in pairs, one up, one down. The new line's signature gum leaf canopies are being installed at six new stations, craned into place, piece by giant piece. Except at Hill Showground, where the canopies are pre-assembled on the ground. Then the entire structure is lifted up and then lowered into place. Each of these two canopies weighs over 60 tons. They're mounted on massive piers, then locked into place. It's the biggest crane lift of a canopy on the entire project. The intricate wood panelling on the underside of the canopy is the finishing touch. And the overall result is beautifully Australian. The landmark cable stay bridge is also now complete. But for passengers to access trains running on the SkyTrain, 13 metres above the ground, two elevated stations are being built out of glass and steel. At this station in Kellyville, hundreds of panes of coloured glass are being fitted that will create a cathedral-like lighting effect for the customers. Along the viaduct, the track works have started, with the tracks and overhead wiring now being installed. The complicated procedure to lay the tracks in the tunnels is almost complete. Halfway along the northwest line at Castle Hill, a massive underground crossover cavern has been finished. This area allows trains to swap tracks in the event of disruption or emergency, keeping services running. A safety feature of the Metro is the automatic platform screen doors that open when the trains stop at the stations to keep commuters safe. At every station, 36 of these doors need to be installed. It's the first time this automatic door technology has been used on an Australian railway. As the finishing touches are added to the stations, their designer, Ross Delamotte, takes a final emotional look and likes what he sees. I'm absolutely stoked with the result. One of the things I really love about this view, in a sense, captures the essence of the project. You've got the wonderful entrance canopy trees with their seasonal colour really bring the station to life. You have the foreground with the sculptural spheres, the sort of playful seats sitting in the public realm. The wonderful landing of the canopy in the plaza and the forecourt. You've got the beautifully lined timber feet of the canopy. Where the canopy lands through the buttresses on the terraces. All of that's animated by natural light and these wonderful coloured escalators and lifts which really, I think, entice people to come down and enjoy what is a great public building. At Blues Point on the north shore of Sydney Harbour, it's a huge moment for TBM Kathleen. After weeks of tunnelling through soft sediments and clay, <laughs> the most precarious section of the tunnelling is over. 
TBM Kathleen has nearly finished her historic first trip under Sydney Harbour. And now the moment of truth has arrived. TBM now is just 700 millimetre far away from here. So it's very close. This time, Journey's End is not a station box, but a very narrow, very deep shaft. All exciting after having done all the, uh, all the crossing under the harbour. This shaft is its own grand central station for TBMs. Three will arrive here to end their tunnelling journeys on the edge of one of the world's most spectacular harbours. It's far too dangerous for anyone to be in the shaft when the breakthrough happens, but an overhang of rock hides exactly where the TBM will emerge, which causes a bigger problem. When to switch off the flow of the slurry to the cutter head. Uh, once it starts to crack, we've got to be quick to change over to a bypass so we don't lose too much bentonite. The solution they've come up with is for Griffo, Michele and Andreas to drop down 30 metres in a basket so they can have eyes on the breakthrough. So, yeah, we'll be calling them, radio them, stop, bypass, good to go. The men in the basket will dangle just above to tell Red Dog and Vincent inside the TBM when to switch off the bentonite. Just so once we do actually break through, there's not a whole heap of it that keeps going. Can you go for three, three on the up here? Yeah. Yeah, I will go probably uh, to eight up here now. Today, rookie TBM engineer Jamie Chirk is rostered on the night shift. But she doesn't want to miss the show. As soon as Adam calls. Will be good. Okay, thanks, mate. The men in the basket are in position. Time to fire up the mega borer. Oh, we're just about to fire up now. Yep. Okay, catch you, mate. Radio. Let's do it. Start another sequence. Cut ahead. Crush up. And now we'll get uh, the slurry circuit going. The four men dangle like bait, waiting for the mechanical monster to arrive. Uh, that's starting to fall. Is the bentonite still flowing or no? It's flowing all right, like a river. Yeah, there we are. Here we go. Time to switch off the flow of bentonite. Here we go, boys. Yeah, we're going down. Well done, guys. Well done. Hello, Blues Point. Oh, yeah. Beautiful, beautiful. Give me the telephone one second. Vinny. Congratulations, guys. Congratulations to all of you. Perfect, perfect breakthrough. Perfect. Give me red. Yeah, red there, double J here. Go ahead. Yeah, congratulations, buddy. Good job. Good job, mate. Good job. Yeah, Yo. buddy. Good man, McKelly. Okay, right, cheers, mate. Adam. Well done, mate. Glad to Proud moment. It's been a good day. Textbook okay. breakthrough, nice clean profile, everything's gone exactly as planned. Very, very, very good, very happy. Jamie is ready to do it all again. Totally keen. It's been a really good trip, like, good, good little experience, so, yeah. Ah, come on! <laughs> very good, we are here. <laughs> Not for long. We're gonna bring the machine out. Dismantle it, bring it back to Barangaro. One harbour tunnel down, one more to go. Back at the Metro Trains facility, it's time to put the new trains through a rigorous series of tests. 
Manny Manolis is in charge. How you going, Westy? How you going, Wano? Yeah, good. How are you? How you going, man? Good, thanks. Nice things, boys, all right? Yeah, good, that's the way. Because... We test until they are 100%. Westy. Watch your weight, no dramas. <laughs> We're checking the thickness of the brake pads. Yep. We are seeing whether... Manny has worked on railways for 20 years. Rubbish. Come here, bro, bring your tool. And what he has seen of the driverless train's capabilities has impressed him. I've seen how other conventional railways work, and coming onto this project, it just blows my mind. Knowing the city commuters is going to blow their minds. Before any train leaves the yard, Manny's team must inspect it from top to bottom. Break. Today, this train will hit the tracks for the very first time. Oh, OK, we're good to go. Just uh, creep forward. Just a green light to creep forward. Nice and slow. Vivian, how are we travelling at the moment? Uh, we're good. I'm keeping the... For these first tests, the trains are controlled manually. And uh, up ahead, we have a suspension point coming up. Yes. So I'll be travelling under 15 uh, over it. So everything else is quite well, yeah? Yes, all good. Great work. Each train must pass an array of tests. For speed and power, signal responsiveness, smoothness of ride, braking, and synchronizing with the automated platform screen doors. Hundreds of cameras monitor the train's progress as it negotiates the tests. Over the coming months, all 22 new driverless trains need to prove they are 100% reliable. During testing, they travel more than 400,000 kilometres. That's equivalent to 10 trips around the equator. Each train is filled with massive containers of water to simulate a peak hour load of more than a 1,000 passengers. Fully laden with 100,000 litres of water, it crosses the Cable Stay Bridge with no problems, and not a drop is spilled. And then there's a need for speed. To prove each train can easily reach more than 100 kilometres per hour, the final tests are to prove the trains can do it all on their own. What I need you to do, Bredo, is start prepping up train five in the maintenance shed. We're going to move that out in the stabling road. That's ready to rock and roll for its uh, movement testing. This train will travel, controlled remotely, from the Operations Control Centre, the OCC. The manual controls are locked away. If passengers do um, decide to um, try to pry it open, Alarms will go off in the operational control centre. The control centre is actually taking control of the train at the moment. The train passes the first few stations. And then it picks up speed. It hits 100 kilometres an hour on the SkyTrain, high above Kellyville. Now, can it slow itself down to stop at the next station and line up with the platform screen doors? Perfect. It gets top marks at every station. With opening day rapidly approaching, multiple teams and thousands of workers all breathe a sigh of relief. So the, the worry factor's out. The worry factor's out, yeah. Yeah, keep on coming, big dude. All good, all good. Nice and slow. I'm very confident. I'm very uh, positive about um, how they're going to run. I'm kind of proud, actually. I'll tell you the truth. I'm kind of proud of uh, where, we've, where we came in a short period of time. Good on you, big D. They're ready to rock and roll. Yeah. Now the trains have been tested, responsibility for their operation has moved into the hands of the Operations Control Centre, the brain of the entire network. Manny is moving over there too. 
promoted to be one of the chief controllers on opening day. So I'll be in the hot seat and just ensuring that everything works correctly and uh, reacting to any glitches. Uh, well done. All right, we kept an eye on that CCTV footage there, managed it as we went along, and we've done it really well. And uh, we'll keep doing it, OK? For days, ghost trains, trains without any people on board, run along the line. Testing the automated systems, testing the operators in the OCC. An evacuation drill takes place high up on the SkyTrain to practice emergency response procedures. It looks like all is in readiness. They've made it just in time. The big day is finally here. Okay. Rod Staples and his safety chief, Steve Jones, arrive early at the stabling yard. Nervous, Rod? Very <laughs> nervous. But I'm sure it'll all go well, Steve. I know, I'm looking forward to it. It's actually great. They're here to watch the trains waking up, something they do all by themselves. No one needs to push a button. This train's been sleeping all night. When it wakes up, uh, it'll go through a whole testing mode. There you go. It's waking up right now. And I can just tell you, I'm so excited. You know, things, things may go wrong, as they do on any kind of new technology. But we've got resources, we've got people in positions to make sure that's minimised. As the train prepares to get to work, so too does the team in the OCC. Now we've got a team here, we've all worked hard to do this, and this is it. Manny Manolis, newly minted as a chief controller, tries to calm the nerves of the people in the hot seat. Just keep it safe and uh, keep your finger on the pulse and we'll just keep these trains moving, we'll keep these passengers happy. There's an enormous amount riding on the next few hours. And though Manny doesn't know it yet, they're about to be tested. With just a few hours to go before the grand opening, Rod steals a few moments for himself. To be able to come out and do it before we get our customers on, I just can't help but think, wow, we've done it. I've actually really been a part of creating something incredible. The new chief executive of the railway, John Lamont, is also excited to be making history. A former head of Manchester's public transport system and air vice marshal in the Royal Air Force, John joined the team in the months prior to the opening. Eight years in the making, finally here. It's a great day for all of us. This is now Australia's first driverless railway. We're really proud of it. He welcomes Sydney Metro's first customer. Yeah. So you were here Thank first, you. I gather. I was the first one here, John. I got here at 6 a.m. and I thought there'd be hundreds, if not thousands, of people here. Yeah. And I was the very first passenger. You're looking forward to it? I am really excited. Steve Jones just hopes he can make it through the day. I'm really, really nervous. And people say to me, are you excited, Steve? And I said, no, it's, it's more like it's just nervousness because you just don't want to let the team down and you want it to be absolutely brilliant for the people of Sydney. But the Transport Minister is just happy the big day is finally here. Thank you, uh, Sydney. Thank you, New South Wales, for bearing with us whilst we got it built. Now it's built. Uh, today we're running commuter services. Done. Beautiful. Oh, I love it. OK, good stuff. A couple of hours later, it's showtime. All right, listen, guys. The countdown is on. Guys, the Metro has been officially opened. Some familiar faces show up for the grand opening. Ali and Gloria, building the city stations on the next stage of the line, want to be on the very first train. And in five years' time, this might be years, right? Yeah, I know. It's really exciting. It's, it's, it's a real inspiration. We are literally down the tracks with City and Southwest. 
So it's, it's actually quite perfect to see this all come together. The two designers, Ross and Xavier, inspired separately by nature, are there together. Without working together, we have worked on the, on the same approach. But the grand architect of Sydney's new metro system, engineer Rod Staples, is understandably very nervous. If you're looking from the outside, there are no hiccups, no niggles or anything. It's like when you're on that passenger jet taking off. We run out of runway now, so we're going to go. We're taking off. There's no going back now. Gloria, you better hop on, or else you're going to miss it. Yeah, let's go, let's go. <laughs> the first train carrying passengers sets off. The train gets to the end of the line, passing through all 13 stations without incident. So far, so good. I'm feeling really relieved to get through the first run. Uh, really excited for all the potential uh, in the hours, days, years ahead. The return doesn't go quite as smoothly. So the door's not opening. On which door is it? Door six on train six, the DC two. The train unexpectedly stops. For Rod, it must seem like an eternity. It's on the move again. Over the coming hours, there are more challenges to contend with. The new metro is being deluged by eager customers. 40,000 people were expected to ride the trains today. 140,000 show up. The system is stretched and the team encounters the first teething problems they were expecting, but hoping wouldn't show up. One driverless train overshoots the platform and automatically reverses. Another doesn't quite line up with the platform screen doors. Engineers are quickly on the scene for fine tuning. The door was isolated. They're going to fix it. They have an isolated. Manny and his team are under pressure. The city's eyes upon them. No. I've got five. For the OCC, it's a baptism of fire. But for every problem thrown at them, they conjure a solution. TC1 receiving, Kevin. Yeah. Over. There you go, she's off. And the trains keep moving. All clear on two. Thank you. TC2 out. <laughs> Together, they pull through. The first day is over and a new record set. So we've got the depot manager there, it's awesome. The biggest opening of a railway in Australian history. I'm really proud of the work that the staff, the contractors, all the people that have worked on building this project have done and created. But really, we're handing it over to the people of Sydney now, to the customers to get in and start to use it. That's what it was all about, and to me, that's the most exciting phase of the whole project. Australia's first driverless metro line is an instant success with customers. Soon, it's carrying 90,000 people a day, much more than some other Sydney train lines. In its first year, it moves 20 million people. The trains travel more than 3.7 million kilometres, and it's helped take 14 million cars off the roads. It's all thanks to the imagination, resourcefulness and sheer sweat of thousands of workers. For eight years, they've given their all, along with their TVMs, the magnificent workhorses of Australia's big dig. But there's a long way to go. More than 30 stations and over 150 kilometres of new track are under construction. Now there's a light at the end of the tunnel. Stage one of this driverless network is up and running. 
revolutionising travel around this global city. This is Sydney's Mega Metro.